for tapes of Full Gospel Businessmen Services, seminars, and conventions, write Post Office Box 4174, Panorama City, California, zip code 91412. Friday afternoon, July the 3rd, 1970. 17th International Convention of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship being held at the Hilton Hotel in Chicago, Illinois. Praise your wonderful name. I didn't want to stop the music. I was just expressing my appreciation for it. We didn't let these people know we were going to have an offertory. Believe me, that's entirely spontaneous. We appreciate that. Wonderful job. Praise God. Let's just take a minute or two to worship and praise the Lord together, shall we? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your wonderful name. Glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We delight in you, Lord. We submit ourselves to you, Lord. We put ourselves under your control. We claim the protection and the covering of the blood of Jesus. We open ourselves and expose ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to the Word of God. We do not depend on natural wisdom or strength or understanding, Lord. We expect to have you open up your treasures of wisdom and knowledge by Jesus Christ and pour out upon us a blessing such that there shall not be room enough to contain it. And we'll be careful, Lord, to honor you and praise you and thank you. Give you the glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. As far as I know, there are no announcements. Remember the book table and the various other places. Uh, there's a number of my books outside which I have mentioned before. This afternoon I'll be speaking on the theme contained in this little white book with a green cover or green lettering on a white cover. I'm not going to tell you the title of it because it might scare some of you. But you can look for it outside. People sometimes say, well, was that message in print? And many times it wasn't. But basically what I'm going to speak to you about this afternoon is the theme in this little book. I've told people that I am like the poem that was written by Alfred Lord Tennyson called The Brook. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It's a little bit out of date nowadays. But uh, Tennyson wrote a poem called The Brook, and the chorus goes this way, Men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. And that's my motto in preaching. Men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. When I get a theme... I just stick to it. People may change, the times may change, but I believe in going through. And I have in the two previous Bible studies dealt with the theme of what God is doing today. I began with that text in Isaiah 59:19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And I tried to show you that this is what is happening today in modern America and all, all over the world. Satanic spiritual forces are invading, particularly this nation. I believe this nation, above all other nations at this time, is subjected to systematic, planned attack by the forces of Satan, an attack that's planned in Satan's headquarters somewhere up in the heavenly. But thank God that the Lord is causing the standard to be raised up against him. That's why we're gathered. And I do believe that in many different ways, one main theme of this whole convention has been our responsibility as Christians, spirit-baptized Christians, to know what God is doing and to take our place in what he is doing, to intervene effectually with spiritual means to change the downward course of events and to bring about a great revival that will sweep this nation and other nations and bring millions into the kingdom of God. I quoted in the first study that scripture, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the peoples of the earth. That's true today, but that's not the whole picture. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. That's the people of God, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. That's God's people, natural and spiritual, 
Israel and the church. This is the time of the restoration of all things. This is the time when Israel, going back to their inheritance in the land, and the church is going back to their inheritance in Jesus Christ. And when this process has really got underway, the church of Jesus Christ is going to arise and shine. And then it says in that 60th chapter of Isaiah, the third verse, and king shall come to thy light and nations to the brightness of thy rising. And I believe this. I believe we're going to see such a move of God across the earth that whole nations with their rulers are going to turn to the church of Jesus Christ as the only source of wisdom and power that can meet the needs of this age. I don't believe we're going to fizzle out like a damp firecracker. I believe the Church of Jesus Christ is going to leave in a blaze of glory. This is my firm conviction. And I believe it's, what, it's the meaning of what God is doing today. Then in the second study I dealt with the power of prayer, certain basic conditions for getting our prayers answered, Especially in Matthew 18, 19, if two of you shall agree, symphonize, harmonize together on earth, be one in the Spirit, touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. I, I, told you, I gave you this little picture of how we achieve symphony. The Holy Spirit, the conductor, the score, the will of God revealed by the Spirit out of the Word of God. And when God's people come together under the direction and leadership of the Holy Spirit and unite in praying according to the will of God revealed in the Scripture, then we have symphony. And the Scripture says, if two or more of us shall harmonize, be in symphony, touching anything that we shall ask, it shall be done for us. I pointed out to you the particular responsibility where there are married couples, husband and wife, united in the faith, the particular responsibility placed by the word of God upon them to unite, to harmonize, that there may be real spiritual harmony in their home, to pray together. And I pointed out to you that in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Peter warns husbands and wives that if they do not live together in unity and knowledge, their prayers will be hindered. And one of the great aspects of the present move of God is restoring spiritual life to the homes of believers, bringing fathers and mothers back into union and harmony with one another. And then they'll be in a position to pray through for their backslidden, back straying children, if, if that's the condition of their children. You know, people are continually coming to me with problem children. And I point out two, to them, two things to them that there's not a single example I can find anywhere in the Gospels that Jesus ever ministered to a child apart from the faith of one or both of the parents. There is no scriptural basis for doing so. So when they come with a problem child, do you know what I say? And if you come, I'll tell it to you. Problem child, problem parent. The problem didn't begin with a child. It began with a parent. And God's program is to solve the problem with the parent. Malachi, the fourth chapter, the last two verses of the Old Covenant, the last great prophet of the Old Covenant, the last inspired utterance before the coming of the covenant of grace. I behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And what will he do? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. These divided homes cause God to smite the earth with a curse. I believe that's the primary reason why the curse is so close to devouring the United States. It's the broken, disharmonious homes. It's the parents that are not fulfilling their parental responsibility. Fathers and mothers, you have no authority in the Word of God to expect a pastor or a youth leader or a Sunday school teacher to instruct your children in the truths of Scripture. It's your business. Thank God for the help that can be given by faithful pastors and youth leaders and Sunday school teachers. But in the last day, if your children are ignorant and erring from the truth of the Word of God, 
you will not be able to excuse yourself before Almighty God by saying the Sunday school teacher didn't teach them right or the youth leader didn't do his work because it's your personal responsibility. Primarily, it is the responsibility of the Father through every dispensation, from the beginning to the close of the Scripture, the Father has two main ministries. He's the priest and he's the prophet of his home. He's the priest representing the home to God and he's the prophet representing God to the home. And any man here this afternoon that is not fulfilling that responsibility is a renegade. And Allah, I think the majority of American males have reneged from their primary responsibilities. They can go out and make millions in business and hire a babysitter and send their children to the most expensive college but they're still failures in the sight of God. And I tell you believers, you can succeed in every realm of life, but if you don't succeed in your home, you're a failure. And if you do succeed in your home, you can succeed anywhere else. That's the real test, what you are at home. Then in my second study also, I pointed out that God places upon believers the responsibility in prayer to pray first for one specific topic. The primary topic of prayer for all believers is not the missionaries, nor the preachers, nor the sick, but the government. First for all that are in authority. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. And I pointed out to you that according to my observations carried out over a wide selection of congregations in different areas, at the present time, less than 5% of God's professing full gospel people ever have any sense of responsibility to pray for their government. One in 20 is a generous estimate. I've been in congregations of three and 400 people and asked how many prayed for your president last week and about maybe five people would rather sheepishly raise a hand. The Bible says we're to pray first for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Good government is the revealed will of God. Here is where the whole church can sympathize under the leadership of the Holy Spirit with the score praying for all that are in authority. Why is it good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior? Because God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And in order to be saved, all men have to hear the gospel preached. And it's much easier to preach the gospel and do the work of the Lord under good government than under bad government. This is the most logical unfolding of prayer I can find anywhere in the Scripture. First of all, prayer. The first topic for prayer, all that are in authority. The first request of prayer that we may have good government. Good government is the will of God because it promotes the preaching of the gospel, which is the aim of God in this dispensation. To me, that is an unbreakable logical chain. I was a professional logician before I became a preacher. And I just cannot escape from logic. It works. And the scriptures are the most logical writings that have ever come my way. The gospel is perfectly logical. I pointed out that the scripture clearly indicates that if we do not have good government in the land in which we live, we are to blame. We have reneged from our responsibility. Jesus said to the Christians, ye are the salt of the earth the salt of the earth, the only salt in the earth. What does salt do? It gives flavor. We are here to commend the earth to God's grace and mercy, that he will not pour out the last vials of wrath and judgment while we are here, but they will continue to deal even with the unbelieving world in grace and mercy because of our presence. You remember what God promised Abraham, that if he could find ten righteous men in the city of Sodom, he'd spare the whole city for the sake of ten. Those ten righteous men would have been the ten grains of salt in that city required to preserve the city. There weren't ten, and so God judged the city. 
How many righteous people do you think it's required for God to spare the city of Chicago? I don't know. But I believe the proportion is the same today as it was in the days of Abraham. I don't know how big the city of Sodom was. But I believe God's proportions have not changed. That a certain number of really godly, committed believers praying according to the word of God for their administration and authority in this city of Chicago can cause God to spare the city. And you know something else I believe they could do? Dethrone the mafia. That may be controversial, but it needs to be done. And it's God's people that can do it. We have the power. Whatsoever we shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. If it isn't bound, it's because we haven't bound it. Now this afternoon, I want to take you out of the piston age into the jet age, spiritually. The invention of the aircraft was a wonderful thing. And we used to think it a wonderful thing if an airplane could fly 300 miles an hour. But then, praise the Lord, a Britisher named Whittle discovered the jet engine and that's revolutionized the whole system of air transportation. This is a fact. Very simple, basic change has made airplanes capable of traveling 600 miles an hour, 700, 1100, 1200. We can hardly know where to draw the line. And in the spiritual realm, there is a way of getting out of the one phase of spiritual movement into another phase. There's one way to make your prayers jet propelled, if you understand my metaphor. And that's what I'm going to speak about this afternoon, how to have jet propelled prayer lines. There's one thing I believe that gives a tremendous addition to the force and effectiveness of believers' prayer. And I'm going to tell you in one simple word what it is. It's fasting. Now, I say fasting and you say fasting, but anyhow, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I mean, I only say that so we don't start with a misunderstanding. Now, many Christians, if you begin to talk to them about fasting, look at you as though you're talking about the opposite side of the moon something that had never even once uh, come across their pathway or entered their imagination. And yet there is a tremendous amount said in Scripture about fasting, and I do not believe that there is any greater power committed to the people of God than the power of united prayer and fasting when it's under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in accordance with the Word of God. Those conditions always have to be added. Now, by fasting, I mean deliberately abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Sometimes it includes abstaining from drinking as well. But I believe in most cases in the Bible where it's recorded that people fasted, they abstained from food, but they did not abstain from drink. Now, on one occasion, two occasions, Moses, up the mountain, neither ate nor drank for 40 days. But this is exceptional. Esther and her maidens and the Jews in Shushan, the capital city of the Persian Empire, neither ate nor drank for 72 hours. But in most cases, it appears that when God's people fasted, they abstain from food, but not from drinking. I say this because I believe we have to be very practical about this. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, and if you have your Bibles, I think it would be good now that you would turn with me. I'm going to begin this study with the example and the teaching of Jesus, first and foremost. For for Christians, I believe that this is primary. And in Matthew, chapter 4, and verse 2, it says about Jesus in the wilderness, Matthew 4, 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered, in modern English, hungry. It does not say he was thirsty. Now, anyone that's fasted even a short time without food and drink will know that the first reaction is not hunger but thirst. 
To me, the indication would be that Jesus drank, but he did not eat. At any rate, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Jesus was the last Adam, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And it's a very, very significant thing. It goes extremely deep to the roots of all spiritual life that the first Adam fell through eating and the last Adam overcame by fasting. This goes much, much deeper than you might think when you first hear it. Jesus had come to the river Jordan he had been baptized in the waters of the Jordan. The Spirit of God had descended upon him. The Father had borne testimony to him. This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. He did not immediately step out into his ministry. He spent 40 days in preparatory prayer and fasting. And he is our pattern. He has left us an example, the Scripture says, in 1 Peter chapter 2, that we should follow in his footsteps. Why do we leave out the fasting footsteps? Is it because it doesn't suit our carnal nature? Is it through ignorance? Or why? <clears throat> now let's turn to the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 6. And reading just verses 16, 17, and 18 of Matthew chapter 6. This is the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And the main part of this chapter deals with three things in succession. Giving alms, praying, and fasting. And the language that Jesus uses is identical in each case. He says, when thou givest alms, when thou fast prayest, and when thou fastest. In no case does he say if. If he had said if, it would have left open the possibility that he did not expect us to give alms or pray or fast. But by using the word when, he assumed that we would give alms, pray and fast. If you believe that Jesus expects Christians to give alms and to pray, it is impossible not to believe that he also expects Christians to fast because the language he uses is absolutely identical. In actual fact, there is not the shadow of a doubt. If you read these words with an open mind, Jesus expected all Christians to do three things, give alms, pray, and fast. And he was not concerned to the least bit with the question of whether we were to do it. The only question was how we are to do it. And he warned us against doing it in the wrong way or with the wrong motives. But he certainly did not warn us against doing it. And that's where I believe a lot of lazy Christians have let themselves be deceived by the devil. They've read the warning against doing it the wrong way as a warning against fasting, period, which it never was and never will be. Now let's read these verses in Matthew 6, verses 16, 17, and 18. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Notice that if you fast with the right motives and in the right way, God will reward you. So if you do not fast, you know what you're doing. You're cheating yourself out of a reward. There is a very clear statement. If you do it in the right way, with the right motive, God will reward you. Any Christian that does not fast in that way is simply cheating himself out of a reward from God. Now let's turn on to Mark chapter 2, verses 18, 19, and 20. Mark chapter 2, verses 18, 19, and 20. And the disciples of Jesus, of John, and of the Pharisees, used to fast. And they came and said unto him, Jesus, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? 
As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. In the time of Jesus, all serious religious persons practiced fasting. It was a normal part of religious practice. The disciples of John fasted, the disciples of the Pharisees fasted. And the people of the day wondered why they did not see the disciples of Jesus fasting. So they came to him and asked him. And Jesus answered them with a little simple parable. He said, can the children of the bride chamber fast while they have the bridegroom with them? No, they cannot. But the days will come, in verse 20, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Now, a parable is to be interpreted, and you may interpret it one way and I another, but I will tell you the way that I interpret it. The children of the bride chamber are the disciples of Jesus Christ. That seems to me obvious. The bridegroom is only one person, Jesus. As long as the bridegroom was physically present on earth with the disciples, they did not fast. But Jesus said very definitely, the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. There's no suggestion that this is the fault of the disciples, that it's because they've backslidden. It's just part of the program of God. And in the days when the bridegroom has been taken away from the disciples, in those days, Jesus said, they shall fast. Now, I believe at the present time the bridegroom was taken away when Jesus ascended into heaven and that he has not yet returned. I believe that we're waiting for the return of the bridegroom. I think 95% of committed Christians must believe that. So we are in the days when the bridegroom has been taken away. And what will we do in those days? We shall fast. In other words, it is a mark of the children of the bride chamber that they are fasting in the period between the bridegroom being taken away and the bridegroom returning. It is a mark of true Christian discipleship to be fasting in this period. And those that do not ever practice fasting lack one of the marks of Christian discipleship in the period in which we live. Now let us turn to the practice of the early church as recorded in the book of Acts. Acts, the 13th chapter. The first three verses. Acts chapter 13, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, later the Apostle Paul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Note it, in this local congregation in Antioch, the leaders, the prophets and the teachers, had come together by common ex consent for a period of public prayer and fasting. This was not done individually. It was not done in secret. It must have been done by common consent. And all concerned must have known not only that they were fasting, but the, that the others in their group we're fasting. This was a matter of common consent. You see, the devil has got a theory that all Christians must always keep their fasting secret. And this theory suits him because it inhibits the most powerful thing that Christians can do, which is to fast and pray together by common consent. If you're always going to do it in secret, then it's impossible to do it in public and by common consent. And that's just what the devil is seeking to prevent. And so this sloppy theory that it's always got to be done in secret has been foisted upon Christians. In actual fact, the same language is used by Jesus about prayer. So if Christians should always fast in secret, then they should always pray in secret. And there should never be a public prayer meeting or an appointed public time of prayer for Christians because exactly the same language is used by Jesus about praying and about fasting. If it applies to one, it applies to the other. But it is actually, in my opinion, mere laziness and carnality on the part of Christians that they have not seen their obligation to come together for concerted periods of public fasting. But the leaders of this church at Antioch, and basically this church at Antioch was the pattern church of the book of Acts. It was the, the one that was the most effective, that accomplished the most, that was often set forth as a pattern to the other churches. The leaders were ministering to the Lord by prayer and fasting. As they did so, God honored them. He rewarded them. You see, God has said he always will reward you. He rewarded them by a special revelation of the divine program. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. 
Now, they then understood that Barnabas and Saul were to be sent forth for a special task and ministry. But notice, they did not immediately send them forth. They prayed and fasted once more. Then, after prayer and fasting, they laid their hands on them and sent them forth. So here we have this group in the church at Antioch publicly practicing prayer and fasting on two occasions. Now, we read in the next chapters, chapters 13 and 14, the ministry and the results of this first missionary journey. Without going into details, let us turn to Acts, the 14th chapter and the 23rd verse. Uh, Previous to this incident, Paul and Barnabas had established little groups of disciples in various cities in Asia Minor. Then having finished their outward journey, they returned back by the same route by which they had come, and in each city through which they had passed, They met together again with these disciples and exhorted them and encouraged them and instructed them. Then they appointed elders for congregations in each city and those congregations were then established as churches by the appointment of elders. That's what made them churches and not just a group of disciples. And notice that in every city, this step of bringing the church into being by the appointment of elders was always done with prayer and fasting. And again, because it involved the whole church, because it was public in the life of the church, it must have been done by public concerted agreement. Let's read the words now. Acts 14, 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Now, you can read that without seeing really what's involved in it, but in actual fact, It means that every one of these local congregations was brought into being as a church by a process of united prayer and fasting. And this meant that for each one of these local congregations from then onwards, they knew that if they really wanted to seek God seriously and get his will and his direction and his blessing, the way to do it was by public concerted prayer and fasting. It was a pattern built into the establishment of every local congregation in the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. Now let's turn on to the testimony of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians, Paul speaks a good deal about the nature of his own personal ministry and its basis and the things that made his ministry effective. And a very definite part of the ministry of Paul was his practice of fasting, which he mentions twice. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, I will not go too much into the background. You may check and look for yourself later. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonment, in tumult, in labors, in watching, in fasting. Paul gives a list of different things by which, put together, he approved his authority established his divinely given ministry. In all these things, situations, circumstances, and practices, he approved himself a minister of God. And one of the things that he mentions is fasting. Not in the singular, but in the plural. The plural indicates it was a regular practice in his life, fasting. Move on to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 27, and we return to the same theme in Paul's life, what made his ministry effective, what he did, what he went through. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 27, and we have to read these verses to get the context at all. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, more a minister of Christ. Now he goes on to speak in what respect he was more a minister of Christ than these people who were his critics and his rivals. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered trip, shipwreck, a night and day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, 
in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Notice Paul was in fastings often, and this was one of the ways that he declared he was more a minister of Christ than those that were his critics and his rivals. Notice he speaks about hunger and thirst and fasting. They're two distinct things. Hunger and thirst is when you cannot eat and drink because there's nothing there to eat and drink. But fasting is when the food and the drink are available, but you deliberately abstain from them for spiritual purposes. Paul says twice he was in fastings often, and this was part of the way in which he attested and established his God-given ministry. And I would say frankly, any person that claims to be a minister of Jesus Christ and never practices fasting lacks one of the means by which he should attest his ministry. His ministry is lacking one divine attestation. To sum up the New Testament, Jesus practiced fasting. He taught fasting. He expected all his disciples to fast. He took it for granted that they would fast just as much as that they would give alms or pray. The early church collectively practiced fasting and prayer in public and established all new congregations that came into being on this basis. And finally, Paul, in his own personal testimony, says that fastings in the plural played an important part in the success and fruitfulness of his ministry. So the entire theme of the New Testament for the Christian believer enjoins fasting as a regular practice for all Christians. Some Christians are very ignorant about the history of the church in this respect. I wonder how many Methodists are here today. Would you raise your hand if you're a Methodist? Well, that's good. Do you know that John Wesley would not appoint to the Methodist ministry, would not ordain a man who would not undertake to fast twice a week on Wednesday and Friday till four in the afternoon? No Methodist man would be accepted for the ministry in John Wesley's day if he did not make that commitment. Is that perhaps one of the reasons why the Methodist Church today is somewhat different from what it was in John Wesley's day? Could be. Now I want to turn to the Old Testament because it's out of the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament that we see the tremendous power, the almost limitless power of united prayer and fasting. If you look at the Old Testament as a whole, and pick out the really outstanding men, the man whose ministry and lives created an epoch, you'll find that we know from fact and testimony that many of them were men of fasting. Let me mention Moses, David, Elijah, and Daniel, and I could mention many others. And I think you'll notice that each one of those men represents an epoch. Moses, the epoch of the law, David, the epoch of the kingdom, Elijah, the epoch of the great prophets, and Daniel, the epoch of the restoration from Babylon. Each man that marked an epoch was, by his own testimony, a man who practiced fasting as well as prayer. It is an epoch-making practice, and I mean it in the best sense of the word epoch. It changes history. It starts a new phase when God's people will do it. Let us look at God's requirements for all Israel. In Leviticus, the 16th chapter, the 16th chapter of Leviticus. Now, this is the ordinances of the great day of atonement. Many of you know, probably particularly here in Chicago, that the Jewish people call this Yom Kippur. Yom Day Kippur atonement. And they still practice it today. It has never ceased in the history of the Jewish people. One day in the year was the great day of atonement. And without going into all the ritual and the requirements under the law of Moses, let me just read uh, in Leviticus 16, verses 29 through 31. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, the Jewish people, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your soul and do no work at all. And then the 31st verse again. Leviticus 16:31. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. Notice that they were told that once every year they had to afflict, humble, discipline, bring into subjection their souls to the will of God. 
Now, the Jewish people have always understood from many centuries before Christ that to afflict their souls was to fast. And I'll show you New Testament evidence of this, which many of you may never have noticed. In the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, and the 9th verse, Acts 27, 9, speaking about the beginning of that famous journey that Paul made in that ship that ended up wrecked on the island of Malta, Luke, who's the writer of the book of Acts, says this, Acts 27, 9. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast, was now already past. The fast was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And because it fell in October, or the end of September, it meant that the summer was past and the winter was close at hand, and for that reason, sailing was then a dangerous matter. Because in the ancient world, they didn't sail much in the winter, and they certainly never sailed across open sea in the winter. So you'll see that in the time of the New Testament, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was known as the fast. This is therefore conclusive scriptural evidence that when God spoke to the Jewish people and said they were to afflict their souls, the way they were to do it was by fasting. And today, every Orthodox Jew throughout the world fasts on the Day of Atonement. This is one mark of Orthodox Judaism still in the world today. Now let's turn to the testimony of David in the book of Psalms. And we'll begin with Psalm 35. Psalm 35. Three times in the book of Psalms, David speaks about his practice of fasting. Psalm 35 and verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. Notice David says, I humbled my soul with fasting. Psalm 69 and verse 10, David said, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. And Psalm 109 and verse 24, Psalm 109 verse 24, David, David says, My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh fail it for fatness. Now your knees don't get weak and your flesh doesn't fail of fatness if you fast, fast half a day. That involves fasting at least three or four days, I would say. So we see that David regularly fasted and he fasted at times long enough for it to be physically obvious in his body that he had been going without food. And when he fasted, what was he doing? He was afflicting or chastening his soul. Now, this is directly in line with what Brother Peter Marshall said two or three nights ago, and most Pentecostal and full gospel Christians haven't even begun to grasp this idea. He's perfectly right, that we have to afflict our souls. We have to chasten our souls. We have to subdue that soulish element in us, which is the rebel element, which is in continual natural opposition that does not want to be subject to God and to his will and to his discipline. And God doesn't do it all for us. We have to do it. We have to deal with that soul. Have you ever thought how many times David addressed his soul? Awake up my soul. Bless the Lord of my soul. Do you know what it was? It was the spirit in David directing the soul to get going and doing what it was his duty to do. It was the spiritual element in David bringing the soulish element into subjective and reminding it of its duty. And one of the ways that David kept his soul in its place, under discipline, under subjection, in submission, was by fasting. And it's a good way. You remember what the Apostle Paul said, I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, after I had preached to others, I myself also should be a castaway. That's a very solemn thought. You, can, you and I can be preachers, brethren, but if we don't keep our bodies in subjection, if we don't keep our souls in subjection, if we do not keep ourselves under the discipline of God, we can preach to others and end up castaways ourselves. And I know those that have done it. This is not just an abstract theory. There are many of us that have been in the ministry quite a while. We could think of man after man after man, preached to others and ended up a castaway because he did not keep that soulish and fleshly element in him 
under discipline. For my part, I'll tell you frankly, I'd be scared to stop fasting. Another thing Wesley said in his journals, I read through the journals of Wesley once and it was a revelation. I cannot quote it exactly, but I'll give you basically what he said. He said, once a person has received light on fasting from Scripture and fails to practice it, that person will backslide as surely as a person who has received light on prayer and fails to practice it. And I say amen. It's true. Fasting is an integral part of the total spiritual discipline of the people of God. And you cannot claim really to be a disciplined believer if this isn't in your discipline. Remember who was first called Christians. Do you remember? It's told you in Acts 11.26 who was first called Christians? Disciples. And those are the only people that qualify by New Testament standard for the word Christian. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. You know what? The church has gone and gone made church members. And that's our disaster. That's our problem. We've got millions of church members who aren't disciples. And they're the weight in the boat. If you've got eight men in a rowing boat and they're all rowing the same way, that's good. But if you've got eight men in the rowing boat and four of them aren't rowing at all, you'd be better without them. The boat would go a lot faster. And finally, if you've got eight men in a rowing boat and four are rowing one way and four are rowing the other way, that's the end. And at the present moment, the church basically is like a rowing boat with some rowing one way and some rowing the other. We don't need more. We need better. We don't need members. We've got too many. We need disciples. And a disciple is one who is under discipline. If you are not under discipline, you are not a disciple. And if you are not a disciple... You are not a Christian by New Testament standards. You can be a member of any church in Chicago or anywhere, but you are not a Christian by New Testament standards. Your soul needs to be afflicted, you know that? It needs to be disciplined. It needs to be suppressed. It needs to be told what to do and when to do. I've got a brother in the Lord who's close to me, Brother Don Basham. I give this testimony for him. I've told him I'd do it, so it's all right. But I've known Don quite closely for about two and a half years now, and there's been a tremendous increase in the fruitfulness of Don's ministry. And one of the basic reasons is that he saw he was in some measure a slave of his stomach. And he told me one day, he said, I gave up eating breakfast every day. He said, I have a partial fast every day. I never eat before midday. And he said this, he said, I have discovered that my stomach does not tell me when to eat. I tell my stomach when to eat. Who gives the orders in your life, you or your stomach? Who's the boss? You know what Paul's saying? There be many of whom I have told you before and tell you even now, weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly, and whose end is destruction. If your God is your belly, your end is destruction. If you sow to the flesh, you know what you reap of the flesh? Corruption. I was associate pastor of an Assemblies of God church for six months in Minneapolis. And one of my duties was to visit the sick. And I had plenty of sick to visit, believe me. Uh, I think in any average Pentecostal congregation, at least 20% are sick. That's my estimate. You can, you, can, you can challenge it, but that's what I believe. I've often preached on healing, and God's will for health, and said at the end, how many need healing? I never get less than 20%. Never. And many of these people were desperately sick with incurable diseases like cancer. And visiting them was a rather gloomy process. And after a while, it began to affect me. And I was saying to God, God, does this have to be? Why should it be? These people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit believe the full gospel, believe in divine healing, and here they are, dying with terminal cancer and things like that. What's the reason? And it really distressed me. And I asked God for an understanding, and I believe he gave me Galatians 6, 
7 and following. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You think that was written to unbelievers? You're mistaken, friends. It was written to Christians baptized in the Holy Spirit because in the third chapter and the second verse he asked them whether they received the Spirit by the works of the, of the law or by the hearing of faith. You know one big problem with Christians? We read the epistles as if they were written to unbelievers, but they were all written to believers. And it was to believers that Paul said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. In simple modern English, you cannot fool the Lord. There's two persons you'll never fool, do you know that? One of them is God and the other is the devil. Neither of them ever get fooled by any of them. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And then he said, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. What is sickness? It's just corruption. That's what it is. It's corruption taking its course. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. What is divine healing? It's everlasting life in our physical body. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 10 and 11, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, refusing to sow to the flesh, in other words, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. That's divine health. The life of Jesus made manifest in the mortal body of the believer. For we which live are always delivered unto death, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. You cannot have the life of Jesus made manifest in your mortal flesh if you're not first delivered to the death of the cross. If you sow to the flesh, if you left the old fleshly Adamic nature control and live on, then the fruit is corruption. Spiritual, physical, mental corruption. God showed me in this connection that many people claiming to be Christians, and I was dealing particularly with Pentecostals, but that's, that's just the way it was with me. I'm not saying it's particularly true. Spend hours every day in worthless, unprofitable conversations and activities that didn't nourish them, didn't build up their faith, didn't make them spiritually minded, didn't turn them toward God and virtually neglected their own spiritual lives. Or they'd spend hours on the golf course, hours in front of the TV set, hours talking about radio or motor cars or vacations, planning their vacation. But to talk to them about the things of God was like they're trying to pull a tooth. They'd been sowing regularly, year after year, to the flesh. God said, it's no accident that they're reaping. What they sow, they reap. A of oil, my pocket, dabbed a little oil on somebody's forehead and said, be healed, that would have been magic. Wouldn't have been faith. For those persons to receive healing, that have to be a deep inward transformation of their whole attitudes and relationships. I don't say it couldn't be done. But without that, it wouldn't be divine healing, it would be magic. And God does not deal in magic. We need to afflict our souls. We need to subdue this soulish, carnal, rebellious nature that's in every one of us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged with the world. It pays to judge yourself, friend. It pays to submit yourself to the judgment of God. I'd rather judge myself than get judged with the world. The true believing church of Jesus Christ should never be judged with the world. We shouldn't be in that category. Abraham said to God, that be far from thee, that it should be with the righteous as the wicked. To the writers of the Bible, this was an awful thought that ever the judgment that was due to the wicked should come upon the righteous. But friend, if you live in Sodom, you're in danger of getting what's coming to Sodom, you see. And parents, I'll tell you this, don't make Lot's mistake. He took the whole family down to Sodom. He did it, the head of the house. And he never got them out again. I don't know how Lot felt about that, but if I were in his place, I'd feel awful. 
I look back at the smoking ruins of that city and think my daughters, my married daughters, are under that pile of ashes. And I took them there. And how many of you parents are taking your sons and daughters a trip to Sodom? And do you think you'll get them out? Don't be too sure. You might get out and leave them behind. And how would you feel about that? Now I'm going on. I want to show you one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Now we're coming back to the theme of fasting. In fact, we've been on the theme of fasting the whole time. First Samuel 31 and verse 13. I, I would like to, I wonder how many of you ever noticed this little verse. The last verse of the first book of Samuel. First Samuel chapter 31, verse 13. And they took their bones, the bones of Saul and his son, and buried them under a tree at Jabesh, and fasted seven days. As a matter of interest, how many of you knew that that was there? Just about a few people. The men of Jabesh fasted seven days. The men of Jabesh were neither priests nor prophets. They were just farmers, ordinary citizens. But they took seven days out in fasting because of a national disaster. Their king and his sons had been slain, their armies had been defeated in battle, their land was overrun by the Philistines. What could they do? Fast. They fasted seven days. You can check on this for yourself, you must do it. You read First Samuel and then read Second Samuel. The general course of First Samuel is downwards. Decline, Division, defeat, disaster. The general course of Second Samuel is upward. Restoration, reunification, and victory. The tide turned precisely between the first and second books. And God showed me by direct revelation when I was fasting seven days that it was the fasting of the men of Jabesh that changed the course of history. If there's one thing God's people can do that will change the course of history, it is fasting. I don't believe it will ever fail to do it if it's done in a scriptural way and with right motive. The question is, do you or do you not want to change history? How many of you here today think that history needs to be changed? Would you just indicate? Well, that's about everybody here, and I agree with you. I'd put both hands up. And I believe there's a way to do it. I believe there's a scriptural way to change the downward course. How much different is the recent history of the United States when we think about division and frustration, disaster? I'm just a Britisher, but as I look at this country, it seems to me that the divisions are getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Is there anything we can do? We can do what the men of Jabesh did. Now I want to carry you on quickly into one of the great purposes of fasting, which is, I would call, restoration. When God's people have got away, they've lost out, they've been taken captive, they're in exile, they're outside the country of their inheritance. The way back is the fasting way. Now this happened to God's people, the kingdom of Judah in the Old Testament through persistent backsliding, rebelliousness, disobedience and idolatry. They lost their inheritance. Their sacred city Jerusalem was captured, the temple was destroyed and they were carried away captive into an alien land, the land of Babylon. But after a certain period of time, in fulfillment of the promises of God's word, God began to show them grace and mercy again. And there comes the period of the restoration from Babylon. There are four main books that deal with this historically. The book of Daniel, the book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, and also the book of Esther. And each of those books is named after the main character in the book. And each of those persons was a person who practiced fasting. And I believe the great key to restoring God's people to their lost inheritance is fasting. Let's look at Daniel first. We'll look quickly at these examples. Daniel 
the ninth chapter. Daniel chapter 9. And I'll read only verses 2 and 3 without going into the background, but it's near the end of the exile and the Babylonian captivity. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. It's a marvelous pattern. Daniel was a prophet. He was also a student of prophecy. And I have no confidence in any prophet that doesn't study and know the word of God. That's the only kind of prophet that I'm interested in. Every one of the prophets of the Bible had a deep knowledge of the revelation of God through his written word in their day. Anybody comes along with a new revelation that doesn't stem out of the Bible, that's not for me. Daniel was a student. He studied the book of Jeremiah, and by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, he saw that the time of the Babylonian captivity was drawing to a close. Now, he could have sat back and said, well, isn't that wonderful? We'll soon be home. And that would have been the height of carnality. What did he do? On the basis of God's promise, he set himself to pray and seek God with an earnestness that he had never displayed in his life before. The promises of God are not an excuse for laziness. They're to provoke diligence. There's just two ways you can react to God's promise. One brings you under condemnation. The other brings you blessing. Daniel saw the promise. He saw God's will. And he set himself to be an instrument in the fulfillment of God's will. And that's what I want to be. I don't know about you, but my personal ambition is to be an instrument in the fulfillment of God's will in my generation. And I believe I have the privilege of living in the most critical generation in history. And I believe it's further privilege to be living at a time when God is willing to do the most wonderful thing. And I don't want to sit back in the sidelines. I want to be in it. I want to be part of it. And I'm prepared to go the way that Daniel went to be a part of what God is doing. Daniel set himself to seek the Lord his God with prayer and with fasting. The 10th chapter of Daniel. Daniel needed further revelation. And it says in verses 2 and 3 of Daniel 10, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh, nor wine into my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all. Three whole weeks were fulfilled. This was a partial fast. He didn't give up, but he didn't eat any kind of rich food, and he didn't drink any wine. And those two periods of prayer and fasting by Daniel were the great lever that started moving God's people back out of their captivity and their exile into their inheritance in God. Then we look very quickly at the example of the three historical books dealing with this period. That's the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. You find them in that order. After Second Chronicles comes Ezra. Without going into the background, this is just a quick glance at these truths. Ezra, the eighth chapter, verses 21, 22, and 23. Ezra, chapter 8, verses 21, 22, and 23. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahaba, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. He was a Jew. He knew the way to do it. We fasted and afflicted our souls and sought a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. They were facing a very long, arduous journey from Babylon back to Jerusalem through country that was infested by hostile tribes and brigands. They had their wives and their children with them, and what was even more important, they had all the sacred vessels of the temple that were to be restored, vessels that were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. How were they to ensure a safe journey? One thing that Ezra could have done was to go to the king of Persia and say, please give us a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us on the way. But Ezra had put himself in a difficult position. How? 
by testifying for the king. And that's what happens to you and me sometimes. We testify and we have to live up to our testimony. He had gone to the king and said, we serve the living God. He's able to protect and provide for all those that serve him. Now, if he were to go back to the king and say, would you give us a band of soldiers and horsemen? No doubt the king would have acceded to his request, but he would have probably been thinking, well, what about the living God? Can't he look after you? Have you ever put yourself in that position? I have. I've testified that God is able to keep us healthy. I took a train journey once in the British Army from Cairo to Haifa. Normally it takes 24 hours. It took us seven days and seven nights on an open goods car through the burning Sinai Desert. I'd found divine healing. I'd been healed when doctors couldn't heal me. And I told the other three soldiers under my charge on that truck that God was able to keep people healthy. They looked at me as though I was already been struck by the sun and laughed. But at the end of those seven days and seven nights, three soldiers reported to hospital. It was the three soldiers. I didn't see. I made my testimony and Jesus Christ was the high priest of my confession. But if you testify, you've got to prove it, see? That's one good reason for testifying. It makes you live up to your testimony. Ezra testified to the king and then he found himself where he had to prove it. Well, they didn't want to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen. They faced this long journey with the brigands and the hostile tribes. What was the alternative? Spiritual protection. Legions of angels. An unseen shield that would cover them the whole way. How could they obtain that? By fasting. So, unitedly, men and women and little children, they all set themselves to fast and seek of God a right way and it says he was entreated of them. God heard their prayer. He granted their request. They arrived back without anyone falling by the way and without being attacked by any of these brigands or hostile tribes. It pays to fast. You remember what Jesus said, if you do it, God will reward you. They did it and God rewarded them. All right, now let's look at Nehemiah for a moment. Essentially, the book of Ezra is the restoration of the temple. The book of Nehemiah is the restoration of the city of Jerusalem. And at the opening of the book of Nehemiah, the report came to Nehemiah, who was the king's cupbearer in the Persian Empire, that the whole city was in desolation. Its walls were breaking down, its gates didn't close, it was just a desolate ruin. And the book of Nehemiah is the record of the restoration of the city, as Ezra is the book of the restoration of the temple. And what set underway the restoration of the temple? Ezra's prayer and fasting. What set underway the restoration of the city? Nehemiah's prayer and fasting. You read Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4. When he heard the condition of the city, Nehemiah 1 4, it came to pass. When I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Do you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Do you know there's a blessing in mourning? If you're mourning about the right thing, and if you look at the church of Jesus Christ today, there's something to mourn about. And the Bible says, blessed are they that mourn. And one way of mourning is fasting. You won't feel too happy when you fast. A lot of carnal self-indulgence that you call happiness will drop away. And you'll begin to find what you've really got. And it'll be much less than you think. But when you've been through the fire with it, it's real. A lot of Christians don't know what joy is. They know a kind of selfish exuberance, which is a substitute for the real thing. We'll go on to Esther. Esther chapter 4. Now, I trust that I'm speaking to people that have some knowledge of the events of the book of Esther. This was the time when Satan came nearest to destroying the entire Jewish nation that he has ever come. Even under Adolf Hitler, he was not so near to doing it because there were only one-third of the Jews under Hitler. But under the Persian Empire at that time, there was every living Jew, so far as we know. And a man had been raised up by Satan to the emperor's right hand, whose name was Haman. And you want to notice, friends, how dangerous it is when Satan's representatives get the ear of the throne. And this is happening and has happened in the United States when witches that should be put to death have gained the ear of your president. And believe me, it's a dangerous moment when it happens. 
Something similar happened in the book of Esther. And Haman was casting lots for the right day to get the whole Jewish nation to start. Why did he cast lots? Have you ever thought? Because he was in league with Satan. He was a wizard, you know, the male equivalent of a witch. It wasn't just a political plan, it was a satanic strategy. He was in league with Satan. What is the, the, the day that we can get the Jewish people? See, He wanted it by supernatural revelation, like some people go to a Ouija board. It was not revelation from the natural, it was supernatural revelation, satanic in its origin. So in this book we really have a clash between the power of Satan and the power of God. And it came to the place where the day had been appointed for the whole Jewish nation to be exterminated. And Mordecai came to Esther, who was a Jewess and the wife of the king, said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, don't think you're safe here in the king's palace. You're a Jewess. You'll be destroyed just like the rest. And this is what they decided to do. Let's read the fourth chapter, the last three verses, Esther 4, verses 15 and following. Then Esther bade them return, Mordecai, this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. The entire Jewish community, headed by Esther and Mordecai, in the capital city of Shushan, fasted without food or water 72 hours, three days, night and day. What happened? The entire course of history was changed. Instead of being exterminated, the Jewish nation won the greatest victory that it ever won at that period in its history. The entire purposes of Satan were totally frustrated and the name of the Lord was magnified and glorified and multitudes of non-Jews became affiliated with the Jewish people when they saw that God was with them. What achieved that? Fasting and prayer. And I'd like to read to you what, what follows in the next, the fifth chapter. That's the next verses after the last part of chapter 4. Esther chapter 5. Now it came to pass that on the third day, that's after three days of fasting and prayer, Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's gate over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. The holding out of the golden scepter was the sign of acceptance. Then said the king unto Esther, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. They had got through. Do you know what I like? Esther put on her royal apparel and went into the presence of the king. You know what I believe about the Church of Jesus Christ? It's time we put on our royal apparel. It's time we started acting like what we are. I read these words with me in Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. God does not want you and me to come to him like beggars. We are not beggars. We're sons and daughters. We're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, half the kingdom is ours. And in the 51st chapter of Isaiah, God admonishes his people. It isn't the 51st, I think it's the 52nd. Isaiah 52, verses 1 and 2. These words are so beautiful, I'll read them but not comment on them too much. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. 
There's the church, a captive daughter with bands around her neck groveling in the dust. And God's word says, shake off the dust. Loose yourself from the bands of your neck. Stop groveling in the dust. Arise, put on your beautiful garments, put on your strength and sit on the throne as if that's where you belong. And we please God more than we'll ever be able to understand when we accept what he says about us. That he's given us a garment of salvation. He's given us a robe of righteousness. He's given us a garment of praise. He has adorned us with beautiful garments. It's about time we put them on and went into the presence of the king and got what we want. But the way that Esther got there was the prayer and fasting way. And that's the way that you and I will get there. There is no bypass. I've got two more passages of scripture that I want to read to you and I'll close this message. They sum up what I'm trying to say. There is in the prophet Isaiah one great chapter on fasting. It's the 58th chapter, the fasting chapter of Isaiah. Unfortunately, many believers have misunderstood this chapter just as they've misunderstood the teaching on the mount and deduced from it that God never wants his people to fast. They couldn't be further from the truth. There is no such thing in the Bible as spiritual fasting. Fasting is fasting. It's giving up food and drink. And there's no other way to understand the word. And no Jew would have ever contemplated giving it any other meaning than that. Some people talk about a spiritual fast, which means you give up something of a length, or you, you give up your bad habits, or you give up smoking. Friend, that's got nothing to do with it. Fasting is just fasting. That's what it is. In the first part of the 58th chapter, Isaiah tells God's people why they fast and don't get an answer because they've got wrong attitudes wrong motives wrong relationships they oppress one another they're unkind to one another they hold their grudges they are greedy and selfish and covetous god says nothing that you can do with that kind of attitude and relationship will ever get your voice heard on high you remember what i said the second entire study that matthew 8 18, 18, 19, and 20, the secret place of all power has got a great high fence around it. You remember my saying then? You can't get over, you can't get under, you can't get through, you've got to go by the door. And what was written over the door? Right relationship. And that's true all through the Bible. When ye stand praying, Mark 11, 25, forgive if ye have aught against any. Otherwise, you're wasting your time praying. If you're going to pray and go back and be mean and jealous and squabble and backbite and criticize, you might as well not pray because it's a waste of time. In fact, it's a disgrace to the name of God. Having a set aside this type of fasting, which does not arise out of true repentance and faith and humility before God and right relationships with man, Isaiah then goes on to these glorious verses from 6 through 12, which set forth the right motives for fasting, the right way to do it, and the results that will follow. You know the church usually majors on the negative. Isn't that right? Usually does. Did I give you that statement somebody made, that unbelief is the dark room where we develop our negatives? What's that? That's about it. Now, a lot of Christians spend the time in the dark room developing the negatives. They could get hold of the fact that we... There's a wrong way to fast, but what about getting hold of the fact that there's a right way to fast? Why why don't we move on to that? Now I'm going to read Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 12. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from thee the, the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. The Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. When I read that list of promises and they all headed with the word then, you know what I want to find out? What I've got to do to get there. 
because I don't know any other list of promises anywhere in the Bible that exceeds the promises of that, those verses. I surely want to find out what then means. And it's pretty clear. It means when I fast the way that's pleasing to God, when I do the fasting that is acceptable to God, that he has chosen. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? God has a chosen fast. What does it consist of? First of all, your motives. What are they? To loose the bands of wickedness. Verse 6, if you want to find it. To undo the heavy burden. To let the oppressed go free, that ye break every yoke. It's a fast that's done to liberate the captives. To set the oppressed free. To bring deliverance and healing. And I know this. That there are many oppressed and many captives and many bound that will never, never, never be set free until the church learns to fast. All our congregations have got them. And it isn't going to be done by one preacher. It's going to be done when God's people meet God's condition. Then the next great requirement of this chosen fast is our attitudes and relationships to others. Verse 7, we deal our bread to the hungry. We bring the poor that are cast out of our house. I understand that literally. Do you know one thing that the New Testament church always organized? It was the care of the poor and the widow. That's the one thing they always organized. You know the last thing modern churches organized? Just precisely that. They'll organize everything else. Now I have to say and make a big exception of the Roman Catholics. In this respect, they're far ahead of the Protestants. They have always maintained a sense of responsibility for the poor. And God has blessed them for it. Doesn't sound good to Protestants, but it just happens to be true. All right. That thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. You know what James said? If you see your brother or your sister hungry or in need of clothing, and you say, praise the Lord, brother, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, be warmed and fed and give them nothing, your faith is a corpse. That's what the Greek said. And a corpse-like faith doesn't make a living Christian. All right, let us notice one other warning against wrong relationships before we go into the list of promises. In the second half of verse 9, if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. Three things have got to be put away from the midst of God's people. The yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. Now I can summarize these three things very quickly. The yoke is legalism. Be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage. You mustn't go here, you mustn't go there, you must dress this way, you mustn't go to the movies. And all that, friend, we've got to get rid of all that. It's not the grace of God. I don't smoke, I very rarely drink, and I hardly ever go to the movies. But my Christianity does not consist in not doing those things. I preached to a Pentecostal congregation in the city of Copenhagen some good many years back now, and they were real legalistic Pentecostals. And I tried to find a way to get through to them that this wasn't Christianity. They had, the women had to have their hair so long, and then you know what they do? They do it up in the braid to make it look short, but they didn't dare to cut it. And... Uh, Oh, so many things. You know them well, well enough. Anyhow, outside this church, where I had to get off the streetcar every day, and I traveled for three weeks each day, in and out, there was a great big statue. Some of you know Copenhagen. You've probably seen it. It's a statue of Bishop Absalom, a bishop of the Lutheran church way back. And it always rather fascinated me, because there's this man riding a battle charger with a drawn sword in his hand, and it's a little bit contrary to our idea of a bishop. So one day I was preaching to these people and I said, you know, I want to tell you something about Bishop Absalom, I said. First of all, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he doesn't go to the movies, he doesn't go to the dance hall, he doesn't even watch TV, but he's not a Christian. You know why? Because he's dead, not alive. Your Christianity does not consist in the things you don't do. If all you've got is a list of things you don't do, you don't have much, do you? In fact, you've got precisely zero. 
So I tell you something, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. Far more religious people in the church will go to hell because of what they didn't do than because of what they did do. It's not the sins of commission, it's the sins of omission with most of us. Legalism, the putting forth of the finger, criticism, tail-bearing, pointing out other people's faults and not seeing your own. And speaking vanity is just plain insincerity, saying a whole lot of things you don't really mean. And those are probably the three outstanding problems of professing Christians today. Legalism, criticism, and insincerity. God says if you could get those three things out of the midst of you and then fast and pray, you'd be surprised at what I would do. And we would. Now let's look at the promises very, very quickly. They follow in a certain order. In the 8th verse, there's the promise of light and healing. Verse 8, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Praise the Lord. What about that? Thine health shall spring forth speedily. When? When you go to a Catherine Kuhlman meeting? Not necessarily. When Brother Roberts lays his hands on you, not necessarily, but when you meet God's conditions in your life, then you might be healed without any preacher, because you know God does the healing. All right. Verse 9, the promise of answered prayer. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. And thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. That's God at your disposal, friends. What do you need? Verse 10 the, and 11, the promise of light on your pathway and guidance. And these are some of the greatest promises in the Bible, I think. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. What a transformation from darkness to noonday. Notice it's then. When? When you've done what God said. The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Guidance and fruitfulness, abundance and plenty. No matter if there's a drought all around you, you're like a spring, of watered, a watered garden with springs that continually flow. And then we come in verse 12 to the great climax, which is what I'm speaking about, the climax of the promise of restoration for God's people. And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to walk in. Do you know that there are many breaches today amongst God's people, many desolations, many things that are broken down? And the way to repair and to restore is the God-appointed way of the fast that God has chosen, Isaiah 58. Read verses 6 through 12 for yourself. Tick off the promises, notice the conditions, and then tell God, I'm a volunteer, and you'll see what will start to happen in your life. I promise you. I dare to promise you because it's on the authority of the Word of God. Finally, let's turn to the prophet Joel. You're a good congregation, and really, I haven't been as long-winded as I usually am yet. Joel. In the minor prophets, he's number two. Hosea, Joel. Joel is the great prophet of this last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the theme of his prophet, prophecy, I always sum up in these three successive phases. Desolation, restoration, and judgment. The opening of the book of Joel gives us a picture of desolation that has never exceeded anywhere in the scriptures. Everything is desolate. The whole inheritance of the people of God, without one exception, has been wasted and desolate and lay bare. There's no fruit, there's no crops, there's no herds, there's nothing. What does God promise to do? He promises to restore the years that the enemy has eaten, the locust, the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar. The theme of chapter 2 is, I will restore. The key word is restore, restoration. 
The agent of restoration is what? The Holy Spirit. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You see, the great restorer, the great recreator is the Holy Spirit. It says in Psalm 105, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, and they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The great recreator, the great renewer, the great restorer of God's people is the Holy Spirit. And so when God comes to this promise of restoration in Joel chapter 2, it's immediately made effective by the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And you get that famous verse, Joel 2.28, which says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Now we know, most of us, that this was quoted by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. These are not drunken as ye suppose on the day of Pentecost, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit. I want you to note it, that Peter was inspired and prompted by the Holy Spirit. He didn't have any notes with him. He didn't have time to run to a concordance. He didn't even have time to go to his seminary professor because it all happened so suddenly he didn't really know what was happening. And the same Peter that hadn't been able to understand half the things that Jesus was trying to tell him in three and a half years got it all like a flash when the Holy Spirit came in. That's divine illumination by the Spirit of God. And he stood up and he said, you want to know what this is? This is what's promised in the prophet Joel. But this is what I want to bring out. Peter, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, changed the wording just a little. Joel said it shall come to pass afterward. Peter said it shall come to pass in the last day. Now, I'm not criticizing Peter because the Holy Spirit prompted him. But what I want to suggest to you is this, that Peter's last days does not nullify Joel's afterwards. They're both true. So, we turn back to Joel and we see the afterward. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And if we're logicians, if we've got a little reasoning faculty, we stop and say to ourselves, why did Joel say afterward? It must be after something that has gone before. And the something that is gone before is what is needed to produce the afterward that will follow. And then if your mind works like mine, you want to find out what went before that's needed to produce the afterward. I don't know whether you're with me, but I hope you are. All right. Now, I have discovered what the going before is that produces the after. It's very clear. And I'll tell you in one word, fasting. This is absolutely clear. You turn to the opening chapters of Joel and look at this three times. In the book of Joel, God's people, prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, are specifically commanded to seek him with fasting. Joel chapter 1, verse 14. Sanctify ye a fast. Call the solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land unto the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. What have we got to do? Sanctify a fast. You know what to sanctify means? To set apart unto God. You set apart a certain period, a certain day, a certain place where all God's people will meet to fast. And everything else is given up for that period. Sanctify means to set it apart, to give it priority over every other thing. Everything else has to take second place when God says sanctify a fast. This is what they did in Acts 13. You see, they sanctified a fast. They set aside everything else to fast and pray and wait upon God. It was an exact fulfillment of Joel chapter 1 verse 14. Then we read on in Joel to chapter 2 and verse 12. Joel 2, 12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. How are we to turn to him with all our heart? First and foremost, with fasting, weeping and mourning. And then Joel chapter 2 and verse 15 and 16, the third time, and I want to tell you that in the Bible, three is the number of solemn warning. I'm not going to try to justify it, but it is. When God says a thing three times, he shouldn't have to say it more than once, but when he says it three times, that's it. You better look out, because the fourth time he's going to say it a different way. You find this in the book of the prophet Micah, for three transgressions of Judah and for four. I told them three times they didn't listen. The fourth time changes my reactions, God said. 
This is it. Joel 2.15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. When you blow the trumpet, that's the most public method of proclamation to God's people. You see, what I'm fighting against is this devil's lie that it's pride to fast in public. It's the devil's way of keeping God's people from doing the most effective thing that they can do. And you know that mean old devil, he'll use any old lie. And the trouble with most Christians is they're not smart enough to stop back and consider we'll see whether it's true or not. If you blow a trumpet amongst God's people, that's the most public proclamation you can make. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Verse 17, that the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Three times, Jobo says, fasting. Then, he says, it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. After what? After you've done what God told you to do, which was fast. See, this is absolutely in line with Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, Daniel understood from the scriptures that the time for the restoration of God's people had come. But this did not mean that Daniel had nothing to do about it. On the contrary, it was a challenge to pray and fast as he'd never done before. And you and I today, looking at the world and seeing what's happening in the church, we know that God's time has come to pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. But this doesn't mean that we have nothing to do about it. It means the time has come for us to do what God said we were to do, which was to pray and fast. I was blessed when I heard my dear brother Gerald Erskine speak about the move of God amongst the Mennonites. I don't know whether you heard him at the breakfast or you've read that book, The Move of God Amongst the Mennonites. If you haven't, you should get it. I don't have it, and I don't know whether it's here, but it's a stirring book. But you'll notice that these Mennonites, who nothing of Pentecost, felt their need for more power and more of God's Spirit and began to pray and fast. They didn't have to ask God to speak in tongues. They couldn't stop them speaking in tongues. And in that visitation, as Gerald records it, this young man gave this prophecy that God was going to do greater things than his people had ever seen on the earth. And what Gerald did not tell you at breakfast, but it's in the book, is this. At that point, which was, in, I believe, in the year 1955, through this tremendous prophetic utterance from this young man, and it was so given that it was absolutely supernatural, it could not be the product of natural thinking, God said to his people, all that you have so far seen is as one and a half drops in a ten-quart pail. That's exactly the words that were used, one and one-half drops in a ten-quart pail. By now we've got to about two drops of what God intends to do. You think you've seen something? You've seen nothing yet. But, God says, now it's your turn. I've showed you that the time has come. I've showed you that I'm willing to move. You can see it's affecting all the church, the Catholics, the Protestants, people in every land and background and denomination. What have we to do? Sanctify our fast. Call the solemn assembly. And I'll point out one other thing. You look at these calls to fasting and you find certain persons are singled out specifically. Elders, priests, and ministers. You can check for yourself. Do you know one thing about spiritual leadership? You have to lead, you know that? You don't lead people from behind. Somebody said to me the other day when I went to a certain area and preached, they said, Brother Prince, why didn't you consult with the leaders? I said, this is private, but I wrote back in the letter, I said, there just weren't any leaders. If you mean a, by a leader, somebody that goes ahead, because there weren't any. There are a lot of officially appointed clergymen in some areas, but don't call them leaders, friends. A man who was officially a leader of a certain group said to me with amazing frankness, he said, I have to run to keep up with the people I'm leading. And I want to challenge anybody here that holds a position of leadership. And I cannot who you are, a priest or a pastor or an evangelist, ask yourself, am I leading or am I not? Because if you're leading, you're in, the, you're in advance. You're in front of the people. 
And one of the ways that God challenges leaders is this fasting way. It was the leaders of the church in Antioch that were doing it. It was the prophets and teachers. And God says the priests, the elders, the ministers. This is God's requirement of his people. And where God's people will do it, God's results will follow. Do you want to see history changed? Do you want to see the mightiest revival that the world has ever seen? I travel widely and in many, many different places through different channels, Protestant, Catholic, and so on. The Holy Spirit has borne testimony in many different ways that God is going to do a new thing in the earth. And it's going to be on a totally different scale from anything that any of us have ever witnessed. And I've seen hundreds of people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a few moments. But what is coming is going to be on a new level. And there's only one way up to that level, the prayer and fasting way. That's how Ezra and his company got out of the natural level into the supernatural. They could have taken the king's horsemen and the company and had the natural protection. But they decided, we'll go for the supernatural. And they moved out of the natural into the supernatural by and they proclaimed a fast and afflicted the soul. There is a way out of the natural into the supernatural. Now, please mis don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that this is magic. It will not do it automatically. It will only do it if you do it with the right motive, the right relationships, and in faith and obedience to the written word of God. There is no magic in God's provision. If you want to lead a carnal, self-indulgent, sinful life, fasting will not bring the blessing of God upon you. There's nothing that will do it. But if you're sincere and in earnest, and you really want to please God, and you want to see God's best and enjoy his best in your life, then one essential part of God's provision is fasting. It's not a substitute for anything else. But nothing else is a substitute for fasting. Fasting does not change the will of God. God's will is fixed. But fasting brings you into a place when you can experience in your life things that are in the will of God that you could not otherwise experience. Do you see that? So, I present the choice and the challenge to you. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather together. And you'll find fasting causes God's people to gather together. That's another secret. I'm going to speak about that, I believe, tomorrow. I, I hear by the grapevine that I'm to be the speaker tomorrow afternoon. Sometimes the full gospel businessmen let you get in the platform before they tell you, you know. And so when you get to the pulpit, I say, now give me my text, would you? Praise God for the full gospel businessmen. Amen. Now let's, uh, let me suggest one thing in terms of, I want to be as practical as I can about this. Most of you, or many of you, are connected with groups that meet for prayer. In many cases, not in an institutional church, but somewhere. In a home or somewhere. Why don't you challenge the members of your group to unite fasting with prayer? This is springing up now all over the United States. In Southeast Florida, where I live, there are many prayer groups. And they are independent of one another. They're not organized by one single leader. But they're in fellowship with one another. And in Southeast Florida, we've got two primary days for fasting, Tuesday and Thursday. The people in Fort Lauderdale choose Tuesday, and the people in Pompano Beach choose Thursday. And some of us choose both. Now, I'm not saying that it should be Tuesday or Thursday, but I do believe a minimum of organization is helpful. In North Louisiana, there are many prayer groups, and they fast on Thursday. And they fast specifically for divine intervention on behalf of their nation. And I believe that's needed, don't you? I believe what Catherine Kuhlman said and what other speakers have said. There's nothing but divine intervention can save this nation. How can we have divine intervention? How can we have a deluge of God's power poured out on every area of this land if we'll move in and claim the promises of God and do what God has challenged us to do 
Before you leave here, I'd like you to make up your mind that under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, when you leave this place, you're going to act on what you've heard. Would you do that? Submit it to the Holy Spirit. Study it in prayer. Somewhere or other out there, there's a book, I mentioned it before, that has this basic theme, and it's probably better expressed in the book than I've been able to say it in words this afternoon. It only costs you 50 cents. I, it's not for the sake of profit, but I wish that you'd get it and do something about it. The time has come to act, friends. Now let's stand to our feet and close this part of the service in prayer. Then if there are those that want ministry, uh, I do believe it's a good thing that we will not turn people away without seeking to minister to them. If you have individual needs of ministry, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need deliverance, you have some other specific need, do not leave. When the others file out, you move up to the front. Take your seat in the front rows. And I'm going to ask my fellow workers and ministers if some of you would stay with me and we'll try to minister to those that need. One man here told me he wants to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Several other people have told me about deliverance. It is not possible in the scope of this convention to minister to everybody individually and counsel everybody individually. We just cannot do it. But we'll do the best we can. And, and many times public ministry is much more effective than private counsel. Let's just ask God to bless what we've heard this afternoon. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We believe, Lord, you have very clearly revealed out of your word by your Spirit what you would have your people to do at this time. Your people that care, your people that love you, your people that want to see your name glorified and Satan defeated and his purposes against this nation overthrown. Lord, we believe it can be done. Amen. You've put within our hands the means to do it, the spiritual weapons that will cast down every high thing and bring down all Satan's stronghold. And Lord, we believe fasting is the secret weapon. We pray for those that have their hearts open to the truth, that this truth shall grip them. It shall penetrate. It shall take its right place in their total Christian living and discipline. And through them it shall be ministered to many others until there shall spring up all over this nation dedicated bands of men and women that will hold on to the horns of the altar and cry out unto God and seek him by prayer and fasting until the fullness of the latter rain comes down in a devil-defeating deluge all over this earth and this nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.